Hi, this is Cameron Bowen, voice of Toy Man, and you're listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D-01. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D-12. Hello, team. Welcome back, and thanks for joining us for Episode 5 of Whelm Season 3. My name's Rich, and I'm with my co-host, Emily. Hey, everyone. In these review episodes, we'll be diving into the plots, characters, themes, Easter eggs, comic book history, and everything else of Young Justice, and use that as a springboard to talk about the creative writing process. Our review segments will avoid any major spoilers for the later episodes of this season, but we'll be discussing them in detail in our final segment, Crashing the Mode. What are you doing? Why are you even here? Just... And why are you trying to make the bugs hate the new gods? There's... I can't talk to you when you're wearing this false form. McGann. Now, little brother. <sighs> Explain yourself, Makam Ors. Don't call me that green name. I am Ma'alifa'ak. Stop it. And with all that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily for... Hello, Megan! Our title of this week's episode is Away Mission. The release date was January 11th, 2019. The in-episode date is just August 4th, uh, one day. <laughs> the writer was Nicole Dubuque, the director was Mel Zwire, and the voice director was, as always, Jamie Thomason. In addition to our returning team... From seasons one and season two, we have a lot of new characters, uh, returning supporting cast characters and actors. A lot of this was all, do we have anybody brand new? We do. Andrew Kishino does the voice of Mantis. And, uh, of course, Jason Spizak, fooling everyone, coming back as Forager. <laughs> Had a leaked photo back in the day. We're like, oh, look. Oh, he's playing. Forager. Why would Jason Spizak be here if it wasn't Wally? <laughs> right. Oh, it's he it's can only he's playing be a new character who's completely <laughs> right. different. Oh, he's we never done that another actors character. can do that. <laughs> right. Uh, in addition to that, we have uh, Brighton James returning as Static. Eric Lopez, of course, back as Blue Beetle. James Marsden as uh, Impulse. Um, also, oh, I just realized it wasn't listed. Isn't Mae Whitman back? Isn't uh, Wonder Girl? Mae Whitman is Wonder Girl. Who we'll plays Tracy Thirteen? Because this is the first time we hear her talk too. Oh, that's great! Actually, that has that was enlisted. Let me take a look. Lauren Tom. Oh, Lauren Tom. Lauren Tom is doing Tracy Thurston, aka Tracy Thirteen. Uh, of course, Greg is uh, back as Lucas Carr um, for a brief stint as well, and then the rest is our regular team. What about Bear? Of course. Bill Fagerback is how I'm pronouncing it, and I think I'm right. There is an open uh, invitation to come on our show and correct us about your oh name my pronunciation. Gosh. I I would love that because not only does he do the voice of Patrick <laughs> on SpongeBob Spare, SquarePants, he was also the voice of Broadway on Gargoyles. So, yes, sir, you are welcome on our show anytime. Yeah. If I remember correctly, I think he was on the TV show Coach as well. He's fantastic. Anyway, he's been working since like the 90s doing all kinds of stuff on TV. He's amazing. Okay. I love him. He's so fun. All right. And with all that out of the way, let's get on to the mission briefing. Just in time for your next mission. This week's episode starts on a new Genesis where a group of sentient bugs are meeting with the new god Orion to make a trade deal. However, Orion betrays the Hive, taking their minerals without giving them the books that he promised. Uh, a fight breaks out, which Orion wins with the help of what appears to be two metahumans, and the Hive vows revenge on the new gods. After the credits, we cut over to Happy Harbor, where the Super Martian household, plus Snapper Car, is enjoying a quiet afternoon, only to be interrupted by Brion fighting with his brother Gregor on the phone. Isn't it the Snapper Car household? We don't know, Plus Rich. Super Martian? I, we don't know. <laughs> they have more people there that are part of the Super Martian family unit 
than Snapchat <laughs> Car does. It's their it's- house. <laughs> Oh, okay. okay. I don't know. Right. I'm just making. Right. I'm just making stuff up at this <laughs> point. Made, we have no idea. He owns the trees. Is all we know. <laughs> Explain this living That's situation. Right. That's right. <laughs> the interruptions continue when Bear arrives from New Genesis to ask Superboy for some assistance. With the help of McGann establishing a mental link between the group, Bear explains that the Forever People have been investigating the conflict that we saw earlier between the bugs and the new gods, but that their search revealed uh, only traces of Earth-human DNA from the metahumans that Orion was using. Bear is now in need of Earthling help. To get to the bottom of this, Miss Martian volunteers to bring the whole team along to help and calls up all the kids to gather for a new mission using a very special ringtone. <laughs> But Superboy needs to stay behind to help Nightwing with the Markovia kid situation. The very excited team then boom tubes to New Genesis with Bear. Back on Earth, Nightwing, Artemis, Jefferson, and Halo all arrive in Happy Harbor via Zeta Tube. And on New Genesis, the team invest- the team's investigation is interrupted by the Hive, who accuse the group of working with Orion. However, Bear explains that the real Orion is apparently off-planet at the moment, and the Orion who attacked the bugs must be an imposter. Back in Happy Harbor, the adults, because can't believe original team members are part of that group now, but they are, discuss what to do with these two meta-powered teenagers, since it's not as easy as just letting either of them join the team when they're untrained and untested and under really weird circumstances. And outside, Halo and Brion reveal what happens when you leave newly superpowered teenagers alone for five minutes. They just start testing out their powers. <laughs> that tracks for me. Makes sense. Yep. Back on New Genesis, the team wait in hiding for Orion to arrive at another trade meeting. However, when Orion does arrive, McGann senses a psychic wave coming off of him and realizes that he's using telepathy to amp up the bug's anger toward the new gods. She recognizes something familiar about his psychic energy pattern and shifts into her white Martian form to confront him. He leads her into the alien woods to talk about it, leaving the team confused (laughs) behind. Back in Happy Harbor, power testing continues with less than stellar results across the board. Brion is having trouble with control and precision when it comes to his geo powers, while Halo discovers that she has energy blasts as well as light shields and flight, but her first use of this new power ends up with her literally knocking herself out. <laughs> and back on New Genesis, McGann confronts Orion and v- reveals that he's actually her brother Makam in disguise. Makam reveals that he's now known as Ma'ala Fa'ak and that he's on New Genesis doing some favors to gain support in the White Martian Revolution against the Green and Red Martians on Mars. There's a lot to unpack (laughs) there and we'll get to it. (laughs) He tries to get McGann to join him in this revolution, but when she refuses, he attacks her. Meanwhile, back in Happy Harbor, Halo starts healing herself while Brion decides to leave the team and become a rage tumbleweed. (laughs) Hashtag rage tumbleweed. Traveling aimlessly across the country, powered only by his pent-up hormonal anger issues. (laughs) I need that spinoff. Is there an AU for that? Maybe. (laughs) However, however, Nightwing prevents this by offering uh, to help him find his sister, Tara who was kidnapped the two years before, which we saw in episode one. Back on New Genesis, the team arrives just in time to help McGann. They take on the metahuman fighters while McGann faces off against her brother on the psychic plane with her, you know, psychic residual energy form being not her white Martian form. Oh, we'll get to it. (laughs) (laughs) I got thoughts. Yes, I bet. Uh, but despite being stronger than him, McGann insists that she doesn't want to hurt McCom and tries to convince him to choose love over anger. While for a moment it seems like she's getting through to him, he betrays her trust and attacks again. McGann easily defeats her brother, but back on the material plane, McCom uses a kill switch on both of the metateens in retaliation. Afterwards, McCom escapes and Forager is banished from the hive for siding with the Earthlings during the fight. McGann offers to let him come to Earth since he's no longer safe on New Genesis, and the whole team leaves the planet in a pretty, pretty somber state to end this episode on. Yeah. Glad we got that always on point last episode. (laughs) That's what we needed. That's right. This feels a master. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. 
Okay. Uh, there's a there's there's so much good stuff in this. There's a lot there's a of lot. Good stuff. There's a lot, and uh, and I have to say, so I'll start off by saying that I'm so glad we got to see the new team. We've been talking yes. about this new team, yes. right? So we get to see Tracy 13. She mentions that she's being trained by Zatanna, Zatanna. Which, is, uh, which is great, the which magic, is fantastic. The magic girls. They're having their and own magical girl her, anime on the side. <laughs> right? And that her powers are based on magical... Bad luck. <laughs> first, first of all, it's magical bad luck. And second of all, the mother box that Bear has can tell. <laughs> it's like, what do you mean magical bad luck? I'm like, the mother box can sense magical bad l- magic affecting? Oh, yeah. But it. still, like, the, the mother box can detect magical energies and, like, determine what they are, which is Apparently. fascinating. Fascinating to me. And I do like that that gives Tracy 13 a little bit of differentiation from other magic users that we've seen. Like, it yeah, gives her exactly. a specialty that we didn't see with Zatanna or with Zatara or any of those Yeah, and it, it's, a, it's a great, like, way to, like, emphasize this idea that she's a – she knows that she has magical bad luck. She has to learn to control it, and she doesn't always know probably what's going to happen when she aims it in someone's general direction. <laughs> yeah. Um. So that's that's a fun, like, teenager-y, like, masks role-playing game kind of stuff, you yeah. know, kind of a thing, which is really cool. So I, I love that and I want more of that team, you know, I and I want to see I want to see where where's Static's friends as well, like from Where's the Runaways? Yeah, where's the Runaways? Where's the DC's Runaways, right? Where are the rest of them? And we've seen a trailer now for something in the second half. It's we might be able to see something about where they went. So we'll get to see hopefully more about what's coming on with them. But I completely agree. I want to see more of that younger team. We get a little glimpse of them when McGann has to call all of them in and they all have the hello Megan ringtone on their phones that I love. Uh, (laughs) But like we see like Jaime and Bart and Tracy all hanging out in New Mexico. And like we see Cassie and Static just sort of chilling in the watchtower. And I think it came up during uh, one of your discussion sessions with some of the storyboard artists about how they wanted to imply that Cassie and Static were like genuinely really close friends, but they didn't have much dialogue to do it. So they just kept giving them like high fives and just putting them in the same scenes together. <laughs> right. And I'm like, I love that. I love that idea. Show me more of that friendship. Show me more of all of these like team dynamics. Show me these kids bonding and hanging out. I want it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Where are, these, where are these youngins at? I love that. I love that Bear shows up and he's like one of the only probably beings in the universe that can give like a no pun intended bear hug to to Superboy and have him go Ugh! <laughs> have him like <laughs> one person who's strong enough for Superboy right. to be like this is too much. <laughs> right. I don't think Super Superman's giving him the big old hugs, but Bear's like yes. Oh, I love it, and I love I love with that scene. There's the implication that the new gods have shown up on Earth multiple times and maintained their friendship with Connor over the past seven years. Because when he introduces McGann, he says, and you know, my fiance McGann, which implies that Bear has met Miss Martian before and that this is just an established thing. And I'm like, I love that. You took one line and told me so much about what the new gods have been up to that no one is surprised when Bear shows up on their lawn and is just like, I have an adventure for you. Right. And he's like, I just, as long as, and Connor's like, I can't go. He's like, well, as long as I have human assistance. And McGann's like, but, but we're uh, not, I, whatever. Never mind. Just That's never one mind. of my favorite ongoing jokes through the series <laughs> right. is Ms. Martian and Superboy both being mistaken for human and being right. genuinely like, but we're not, but it, it doesn't matter, but we're it's not. Right. I love when they first show up on the planet and Bear's like, do you sense human activity? <laughs> He's like, That's not. <laughs> How this works? Is that, quite how it works? Is that how new gods work? <laughs> like, it's apparently how just... mother boxes work. But like, can the forever people just kind of like enter a space and be like, "Yes, Dreamer was here <laughs> two hours ago," <laughs> right? Maybe, or maybe they can't, and they think humans are strange and weird with these meta genes. <laughs> maybe, maybe oh. that's so funny. Speaking Spe- of Dreamer, speaking of Dreamer, <laughs> <laughs> we're good at those segues. But it boom. There is a line in this that we did not talk about in Scream Something because it's just kind of thrown in there and left me with so many questions the first time I heard it, where after finding out that Connor and McGann are engaged and referring to them as life mates, which is real cute and is a favorite trope of mine, (laughs) Bear just kind of goes, Dreamer and I 
uh, well, no, another time, and then moves on. And I'm like, wait, are Baron Dreamer a thing? Is that a comic I, book throwback thing? I don't know enough about them to be able to tell you, but that'd be cool. I like that. Well, except that they're not together again. Not that now they're not together now. Know. We don't know. He doesn't say. Perhaps another time. Like, are you saying, oh, yeah, no, we just got married. Or are you saying, oh, we broke up since the last time you saw me on Earth. Like, what? What is your relationship status between these forever people? <laughs> Tell me your secrets, forever people. Oh, I just said this, like, I was thinking, what, what would their ship shipper name be? And then it, I went on a thing in my head real quick there because the... Bear is often represented spiritually as I think it's kind of triggered by this idea that they sleep for these really long periods of time. They're actually associated with dreaming, like dreaming energy. So um, I find that really interesting, this crossover. So, so cool. Well. <laughs> maybe, their, maybe their shipper name is Another Time. I don't know. Yeah, maybe something else. I don't know. OTP Another Time. <laughs> right. Exactly. I love this. You had pointed out this line. I... I don't remember if I caught it before that was it was it was it uh Snapper Car? Yeah. Who says yeah. it? Yeah, Snapper Car when uh Nightwing shows up with everybody's and explaining the G designations on the Zeta Two. <laughs> Snapper Car's like, so you hacked the Justice League computer and Dick Grayson with the biggest smile on his face just goes, I hacked the Justice League computer. <laughs> <laughs> and it's such a nice callback to that first episode of season one. <laughs> like just that smug Dick Grayson, I can I can hack into anything attitude. With the, yes, absolutely. He hacked the motion sensors. I hacked the motion <laughs> hacked sensors. The motion <laughs> oh, I love it. There's so many good little things in this episode. Like there's that. There's I really like McGann's scrapbook. I just love it. It's real cute. And it's all photos it's that we've one. seen throughout the rest of the series. If people are looking close, like there's the Dick Grayson and Artemis selfie from season one. And there's like the photo of Artemis and Wally that they use in everything to make us cry of them with their uh, with Bruce Lee, with their dog. And it's just yeah. a couple of those. And they drew some new ones clearly to go with this. But it's just nice. I like the idea that she has a team scrapbook. <laughs> it's real cute. It's so McGann. <laughs> It's Rome again. <laughs> yeah. I, I just I just gotta talk we gotta talk about Macom. Okay. For a minute. Let's let's flash forward to that, I guess. There's so much to talk about with Macom. Like there's all there's a lot of little things that we we can talk about, but Macom, like so we didn't get to talk about this and some other stuff, like the DC dailies and, and stuff like that. But he like we I didn't know he existed until we did that actual play <laughs> podcast. Until we did the actual play where Brendan Conway came on and ran masks for us, I didn't know anything about McGann's family, except that Jean was her uncle. And that was it. And then we get into this actual play podcast, and it's like, oh, it's a white Martian. And Emily says, oh, is it my dad? And I was like, <laughs> her dad? What? And then he's like, no, it's my, it's your brother. And she's like, oh, that makes sense. I'm like, what is happening right now? I don't... Where... Is this information coming from? And you were floored and everybody was floored and it was terrible. Seeing everyone's shocked faces during that recording was the best thing ever because that worked out <laughs> so much. Like, because because Brendan All the Conway characters didn't, had didn't, their jaws dropped. <laughs> so like, did the players. And that's one of those things where like I knew that before we started recording. Like that wasn't something that Brendan Conway like even told me about beforehand of like, you should know these things about McGann. That was just yeah. something I knew. And he didn't know that I knew that. But when he brought it up and I'm the only one at the table who's like, ah, yes, this makes sense. It was the perfect thing of like, oh, we're all on the same wavelength here. This is perfect. You and he were on the same wavelength. Yes. The rest of us were all, what? But like you were on the right now? wavelength for your characters. Absolutely. That's true. But then, like, there was that, I mean, this whole moment where he was like, you left, and where were you? This happened in the AP, where it was like, I came to find you, and, you know, it hurts. Like, all this stuff that was happening, like, in that, I was like, this ha gives me some really interesting headcanon, because with, with seeing this scene where he's talking about, like, you left, and you left me, you know, back there, and I'm being, there's all of these problems, and you don't even know, and you ran away, you know? It's just like, oh, and then he's like, you know, I, my name is Malafak. And then I was like, oh, no, <laughs> like, 
Wait, and then we had had in the comic commentary, she mentioned a Ma'alafa Ak it, randomly in one of the tie-in comics as this shape-changing, you know, like a uh, feral beast thing that's on Mars. And I was like, well, that's weird because Ma'alafa Ak was John Jones's brother who's like his, you know, evil counterpart or whatever. Um, and you can see that character in Justice League Doom, by the way, if you want to see that that version of the character, the animated thing, and of course in the comics. But And then so having having him name himself after this thing makes a lot of sense and makes it interesting and adds some depth, but also, you know, implies some terrible things that we'll talk about in Crashing the Mode. With, uh, with the naming thing, what killed me is when he says that this is his new name and McGann's like, oh, don't be ridiculous. And he says... Because she's like, oh, it's that's just a feral beast. Stop doing that. Stop playing pretend like this. And he says, you know, it's what they call us behind our backs. And I'm like, uh, oh, that is such that's such good world building, and uh, that's so I painful. Didn't catch that part. You didn't catch that? Uh, oh, because no. he's he because he gets right up in her face when he's in the Mall of Oc form and just goes, you know, it's what they call us behind our backs. And she's like, that may be, but and like tries to move past that, and I'm like, oh, but that's so good. That's such. And he's painful trying to own it. He's there. trying to just just own it. Yeah. Oh man! And the scenes of flashbacks when they were kids. The tiny, adorable white Martians that should tiny, not be that cute, but are. And where she's protecting him, and then he's like, he's like changing the memory yeah. for like what he wanted to do, but he couldn't because he was too young. And then now he's doing. Ah, oh, there's just so much, so much going on in those scenes. And then having her try to reason with him and then have him, you know, like, can you help me? And then attack her. And and though, like, he's – and then he, he triggers these, you know, these fail-safe mechanisms inside these kids' heads. And, like, he's clearly a villain. Like, he's clearly, like, an antagonist, right? Yeah. At, at best, right? At best. There's also a part of me – I hate to say it, but, like, there's a part of me of, like, man, if this is going on, right – back on Mars and and McGann left. We still don't know why she left. She didn't bring her brother with her, right? If she did stow away on John's, you know, one of John's, you know, bio ship to come back to Earth or whatever she did to get to yeah. the planet, she didn't bring him, she didn't bring Macom with her. We don't know how young Macom is in comparison to her is part of it, I think. Because he's her little yeah. brother and she was the equivalent of 16 when she left. Like, right. I don't know if there was some, like, she could have been like, I can't take, like, the thing that Jade does of, like, I can't take a 10-year-old on the streets. And that's true. And so they said that she's the equivalent of, I want to say, 42. It's, I forget what the math is, but it's like. Well, so in in, yeah. in that Justice League episode, or in that episode where they were picking new members and they were talking about chronology yeah. versus. It's because she's 16 Martian years old and whatever, because <laughs> I did the math on well, this it's... one time when I was 13. <laughs> Right. Okay. <laughs> it works. But out she's as like she's 16 emotionally, years. she's sixteen years old. But in Earth years, she's forty-two. Yeah. Right. And so that means if seven Earth years have passed, or eight Earth years have passed since that episode, seven and a half, whatever it works out to be, she's almost fifty as far as Martian years are concerned. But then if there's you know whatever that works out to be, three and a half years. So he's only aged two years from when Martian maturity wise since she left him. So if he was 10, maybe he looks older and big, but he's really only the equivalent of maturity of 12 or 14 years old or something. You don't like there's there's so much like to speculate on. And And I only realize that now talking about it. I'm like, this could be technically a child who is doing all of this crazy stuff. Yeah. Makes it more painful. (laughs) Right. And who's and who's probably like, I mean, she's been gone for years. So yeah. like he's who knows what's been happening. I know that Barzoom, I mean, they've been back to Mars. But Barzoom has called from Mars. He needs your help. He needs your help. Right. So that we know that that sh- not only can she go back there, she yes. has gone back there. Right. Do they establish a Zeta tube between? Oh, I guess maybe they can't if they still have those satellites in orbit. But like so she can go back and forth maybe. And if she does, has she? Did she see her family while she was there? Does she know what's happening? Like, there's so, so many questions, right? Because it's only been two years. Yeah. So when she went back there, there was something, I don't know. There's a lot going on. And, oh my gosh, I have stuff in Crashing the Mode too with his influence on things and 
and who he is and who he may become. Like, there's just so much going on. And just the introduction and making him her brother instead of John Jones's brother is beautiful for Young Justice. Makes perfect sense. So... And I think they hand and I think they handled all of it in this episode really well of making you feel for that character. You can watch this and go, everything you're doing right now is horrible, but the reason you're doing it, we can understand. Yeah. And that's that can be difficult for a character like this. Cause like you're watching this, you're like, yeah, no, ri- ripping apart another person is not a heroic thing to do. But also we understand it, if you feel like it's in self-defense of you and everyone you know and love, yeah, there's something to it. Like it, it's mixed emotions about like no, but yeah, but I understand, but no, but I, I'm not in that position. So yeah, you know what I mean. Those of us who are privileged enough not to be in that position, <laughs> yeah. So absolutely, you know, man, it's tough. Anyway, heavy stuff going on with that. Yes, um, with extra gut punch for me having that tie-in to. I don't think I would have been emo- as emotionally affected I, I, if I didn't, because I, I haven't. I, the only thing I know about her family is from what you've told me in that AP. <laughs> if that if that didn't happen, I might have been like, "Oh, she's got a brother. Oh, interesting, right?" As opposed to like, Ugh. <laughs> "Oh no, 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 not McGann's brother." <laughs> yeah, who no. we didn't even have a name for in that AP. That was no, like my true. first thing when he showed up in this. I was like, "What's his name? Give me a name. I need a name <laughs> now." Ma- his name is Mala Fuck. His name is Makam. <laughs> <laughs> Ma'alafa Makam. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, but oh, no. I... Anyway, uh, is a lot. There, it is so much, and there's so much great stuff going on with that scene of... I know we talked about it in Scream Something, but I love that McGann's psychic form is humanoid. I love what that says about her and how she sees mm-hmm. herself and how she views the world and the fact that, like... McComb tries to call her out on it, and she's like, we don't have time to talk about that right now. We're moving on. We're talking about you and your desire to blood rage. Uh, (laughs) Because that's the thing. If you hand an episode to Nicole Dubuque about Miss Martian, she is going to do something interesting with the way McGann thinks. This happens every time we give Nicole Dubuque (laughs) an episode, and I love it. I love all Uh of her episodes. And I love the callback of McGann's friends and specifically her love for Connor being her strength and her protection in her mental form. And we'll see, we see stuff with that later crashing the mode, but like this having when she is trying to explain to McCall that like love and caring about people is strength. Mm -hmm. It's all of her friends. And when he attacks her, it's Connor's shield being what protects her. And that perfect little callback to bereft about how when she helps repair Connor's mind, the first thing she does is make the Superman shield. Yeah. And how he is part of her strength. And I love that. Yeah, as sure. no one is surprised. <laughs> it makes me feel like McComb can't understand that because his self-defense mechanism is, I have been alone my whole life. I have had no one. The only person I kind of had abandoned me. So... You want to love these people? That's great, but it's a weakness. You can only you can only find strength within yourself, and this is what I have to do. And it's just like ugh. anyway. All right, let's move on to something a little more lighthearted. Moving on to lighthearted. Uh, <laughs> going back to the lighthearted, I love the real quick moment that Cassie and McGann have on New Genesis when they first get there. That's Cassie <laughs> complaining about Tim and McGann just being like, super Tell hearing, me about super it. sight, super sight, super hearing, <laughs> super oblivious. And like, if you look back at season one, yes, <laughs> early Connor, like McGann is going out of her way to be like, hi, I like you. And he's just like, I don't know what human emotions are yet. Like, give me a couple weeks. <laughs> he was only six months old. He was trying his best. He's trying his best. He figured it out. High school junior helped. But <laughs> I love that scene. And it just makes me really want like more big sister McGann girl talk with like the rest of the team. <laughs> like I just like have her just like have to sit all the teenage girls down and just be like, I've made cookies. Come bring me your problems. And then juxtaposing that with like when she first starts interacting with McCom, like our, her, they're late as that conversation progresses it gets dark and it gets emotionally resonant and it's beautiful but at first she is just this exasperated big sister who's like what are you doing here yeah. stop it i can't take you seriously when you look like this and just like slaps him in the chest 
Yeah. <laughs> like, and that's so good. It's so wonderful. And it's a dynamic we've never gotten to see with her before because she has always kind of been everyone's like little sister. And then we are seeing her as the older sister to these characters, the same way like in the previous episode, we got to see Artemis as another character's big sister. Getting yeah. to see her in that role is like, oh, this is so good. It's so good seeing them grow and evolve into these roles. Another bit of lighthearted thing. I linked to this in our outline, and we'll probably include it down in the show notes. Several of the storyboard artists from uh, Young Justice have been posting on Twitter like some of the early storyboards for <laughs> lines that got cut <laughs> from, yeah. the, from episodes now that yeah. they're out and they can do that. And one of the ones from this, when all of the adults from the team, all of like Jefferson and Superboy and Nightwing and everybody, are talking about what to do with Halo and Brion. <laughs> Nightwing is like, can we? Does a covert ops team seem like the best place for this world famous prince? And Artemis <laughs> completely deadpan in the original script, and they had Stephanie Lemlin record it completely deadpan. Just goes, I don't know. Was the f- world famous foster son of Bruce Wayne the right fit for a covert ops team? <laughs> Give him a mask <laughs> and watch. <laughs> go watch the storyboard. It is hilarious. It's wonderful. I'm sad it got cut, but yeah. <laughs> it's so good. Need to need to boost the signal on that. Go look at these storyboards. It reminds me of one of the the bonding moments that we've that we see between Artemis and Dick through yeah. several of these things where they've grown so close, you know? So good. And continue to see actually. The no the powers, future. no problems team. I love it. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Cause they even have that moment because Snapper Car is like They've got both got meta powers. Just put them on the team. And Artemis just goes, uh, meta powers aren't required. And she just kind of points at her in Nightwing. <laughs> She's just like, uh, so, us. There's like six layers of wrong with that statement. Um, <laughs> also, it's not a free ticket. And also, do they want to? And also, yeah. Uh, exactly. Which oh, just brings us back to the thing Neil pointed out where Snapper Car is like, <laughs> not having memories isn't required for doing something stupid with the team yeah, or I mind control let, or something <laughs> yeah i once i once let the joker into mount justice and <laughs> neil was like i so wanted to have connor just go yeah i know because it's in the first issue of the tie-in comics issue <laughs> right. one of the tie-in comics who really right. goes through like that crazy residual memory of the right, game but it's but it's a psychic construct yeah it's happening so luke Lucas Carr couldn't possibly know that Superboy knows unless he's like, wait, did Super Superman tell you that? Maybe? <laughs> What's happening? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I lived I through it. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> it would have been so good. But What was um, up with that hair, you know, or something? <laughs> uh, and with that same conversation, I really, I love in this episode that because this episode has a lot focused around McGann and how she uses her powers and how she has come to terms with like the ethics of her powers and trying to impart that to another Martian who is currently like not yeah. caring about other people and their lives. Um, they have this moment where Jefferson is like, wait, can't, can't McGann just read Halo's mind and figure out if something oh, weird yeah. is going on? <laughs> and Connor goes, not without ripping into her mind, McGann doesn't do that anymore. And like seeing, having that, that bit of like her ethics tied into both of these storylines. It's good. It's a nice little yeah. through line and a nice way to connect everything. And it's also followed up with Connor being super grounded in like knowing who he is. Cause he's like, I know it seems kind of hypocritical, but Brion is a ball of rage and probably shouldn't be on the team. Like I know I was, but <laughs> and getting to see him be, it's like seven years later. He's like, I was a lot. I at 16 <laughs> was indeed a lot. <laughs> And this boy is also a lot, yes. but this boy has less excuse for being a lot because I didn't exist until six months before you found me. Right, exactly. <laughs> uh, but it's it's so good. I love I love I love all of our teens being adults now in this episode specifically. You know, there was one kind of bumpy bit that I agree with you on as well. There was something that seemed a little strange, and it seems even more strange in retrospect as yeah. well. So there's a, you want me to go into it? No, yeah, go for go for it. Go into that. There's one little bit that keeps standing out to me as like kind of weird, especially rewatching it, is after Halo tries out her new powers and knocks herself out and Brion is about to leave and she's sitting there glowing purple because she's healing herself. Brion calls her Violet and just like has a way of like referring to her and it just comes off as a little forced. And I get yeah 
why they did it on some level because they wanted her to have a name. And I don't think it's really crashing the mode that much to say that she decides to call herself Violet after that. Right. Which is because it was the the original Halo's name is Violet. You know, character was Violet as well. And later, and, and again, not crashing the mode, later on, she even says like, oh, I want to be called Violet because that, you called me that that one time. And he actually says like, I did? Yeah. Like he doesn't remember, which makes it even more weird, like yeah. strangely bumpy. And it's it's so, it's really digging. Like it's kind of minor. And I get it. But like I, when it happened to me, I was like, well, that's, that was an odd choice. You and know? it's like, okay. and my mind as a like fix quote unquote for that could even be something of having someone say oh she's violet right now like referring to what color oh, she is smooth. glowing yeah. and just mm-hmm. doing that of having it be saying something as a descriptor of her and her going i like the sound of that and i'm taking it uh to me kind of would have flowed better than just having him genuinely use it like it's her name when it's not yeah <laughs> It yeah. doesn't even feel like a nickname because he does pause before. He's like, I'm sorry, you got hurt, Violet. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It feels like no, someone like went, that. somebody needs to call her Violet by the end of this episode. Yeah, and I like that idea, draft that solution you were talking. Yeah, exactly. I love the solution you're talking about. Yeah. That like, you know, oh, she's Violet now. I could see her going like, I am Violet, you know, or that yeah. kind of thing. Like, and then... <laughs> Right, and then just owning that, uh, yeah. yeah, I really like that. I think a lot. it just need needed one more pass, and it's not a big thing. This is us nitpicking stuff. But if we yeah. don't nitpick anything, then all we do is say everything wonderful about this. <laughs> right. But along those same lines, and I think this actually works as a really good character choice when they're all trying to get Brion to stay, and like Superboy is listing like complex concepts of why he should stay. Of like, you need a purpose. You need all of this. It feels like Nightwing just kind of panics and just goes, we'll help you find your sister. And he's like, okay, I'll stay. <laughs> like, right. I feel like Nightwing was not sure what he was <laughs> signing up there for. Right. There he was just like, um, we need this kid to not wander off. What What can I use? Well, when we're sister. reading the description earlier, I just had like the 1970s Hulk TV series, like soundtrack move going through my head where where Bruce Banner's, David Banner's like wandering from town to town with like in the rain with a backpack on. Yeah, exactly. He's a rage tumbleweed. He's a rage tumbleweed. The old, you know, you wouldn't like me when I'm angry. He's just going from yeah. town to town, saving people and moving on. You know, it's just like, where's that show? <laughs> oh. There's a whole string of towns that have volcanoes in them now. We don't know what's happening. <laughs> it's what he does. It's his thing. And... Winding down for the last couple of things here, I got to point out that Forager, voiced by Jason Spizak, is so cute. He's so cute. He has no Forager's right to be this cute. When He's they released so good. the first art of him and they had some interview where someone was like, oh, yeah, Forager in the series is adorable. I was like, what are you talking about? He is a big, giant bug man who looks like forearms from Ben 10. <laughs> this isn't cute. And then the second he opens his mouth and Jason Spizak has like that adorable little bug voice. I'm like, oh, no, I want to protect him forever. <laughs> right. Oh, he's so good. The scene where he's like looking back at his home. Before he goes oh. into the boom tube, was just like, oh, oh dude, crush yeah. me. And they have that moment where we talked about this before. We love the little thing where when McGann walks up and is like, you can come back to Earth with us and like extends that offer to him. She yeah. she shape changes so she has four arms so she can hold all of his <laughs> right. hands because yes. she wants to make him feel, feel comforted yes. and is real good. Oh, it's so good because then it ties into McGann's stuff that I love talking about, about how she as a character, like when she sees characters in that kind of distress related to not having anywhere to go, she immediately Mm -hmm. latches onto this is like, oh, that's something I understand. Like if Connor can do the, oh, this is a rage child, I must help. Like McGann does the same thing with people like, oh, you have you have been thrown out. You have been put in a position where you have nowhere to go. And I like that that she immediately goes to Forager and just knows. <laughs> I agree. I agree. I, I have nothing to wrap up with that. I've got a stuff that all goes into crashing the mode. Well, then let's let's move <laughs> let's, on so we can get to that crashing the mode. Take, let's take a quick break and then uh, do a canary debrief and crash some modes. Ah, yeah. Uh, welcome to the Fake Your Own Death Club. Its membership is very exclusive and I'm the president. Hello, team, and welcome to the mid-roll. This week, we'd like to thank our newest Patreon member, Dave. Thanks, Dave. 
And huge thanks to Kaylee for moving up from Gamma Squad to Beta Squad. Thanks so much for your support. If you are a Gamma Squad member or higher, please make sure we have an email address on file for your account on Drive-Thru RPG so we can get you your PDF copy of Masks, A New Generation. Alpha Squad and higher members, I'll be contacting you soon to offer an additional bonus. Free copies of supplements, thanks to our friends at Magpie Games. Thank you so much for your support to all of our patrons. More reviews are coming in weekly. Thank you so much, everyone. This week, I want to share one from Starberry Chim. Totally crash. Hey, YJ Files, I'm fairly new as far as podcasts go, but I've listened to almost all of the YJ Files that cover favorite episodes. You guys are so amazing with your reviews, putting fans' feelings into words. I appreciate your hard work. Thank you. YJ is honestly my favorite animated show of all time, so I was ecstatic to find a podcast to give its production and writing the justice it deserves. Canary debriefs are my all-time favorite part of the pods, by the way. Can't wait for more episodes. Thanks so much. I'm so, so glad that you enjoy the Canary debriefs. Um, they were a very important part of what uh, the vision that Caleb and I had for the show from the very beginning, and I'm glad people are enjoying those. Finally, last week at WonderCon, it was announced that the second half of Season 3 will be released starting in July of 2019. Uh, That's a month later than we were originally told uh, for the release date in June. Unfortunately, we still don't have an official announcement about Season 4. DC Universe, if you're listening, the fans are trying to stay trot. We know how long animation takes. We all, every fan around the world, have put a lot of love and support into Young Justice. An announcement in support of the show we love and the money and time we've put into supporting the new platform would be a huge relief to us. Thank you for giving us what we've gotten so far. Let's work together to make this the longest-running superhero animated series in history. And with all that out of the way, let's get back to the show. Stick around. Class is in session. So for our Canary Debrief today, I want to put on my gamer hat. And I think we're going to do this next episode a bit as well. We're going to talk a little bit about bringing some mystery and some moral or or ethical questions or mystery into um, stories that you're doing. And in this case, it's the the way that the team is brought into this conflict between two parties they don't know very much about at all. Um, and not knowing necessarily which side to take and then finding out, of course, partway through that maybe one side isn't, of course, very reliable. So in, in this case, the team shows up um, because they have an ally, Bear, who is asking for their help, but they're not sure what's happening. Bear's asking for help because basically the new gods are being antagonistic toward the bugs, creatures and characters that the team has never met. So setting up a setting up a scenario like this has your characters gives your characters moments to reflect on who they are and and what matters to them and maybe having a situation where there's not always a good choice. And this one is pretty straightforward, right? You find out that um, a calm is actually affecting the minds of the bugs and you know he's clearly the antagonist in this situation but you can put characters into a situation in which there are two sides happening maybe there's a link to one side but maybe the other side the individuals they haven't met um have a right to be upset and if the characters are helping to um say negotiate balance between these two groups give it give them to them like a choice of well there's pros and cons to each which one are you going to choose there isn't always a clear choice um some role playing games f- lean into this pretty heavily games like legends of the five rings um leads into this idea that it's it's a different culture and it's cast and it's it's level of individuals and various things that are happening and and the choices that you make between clans or between individuals maybe is not as clear cut as you might think it depends on the reality level that you want to turn your game up to. And this can apply in novels as well. If you're doing um, a fantasy story, then that reality of having neither side necessarily being right or entirely wrong gets into that kind of reality grounding. But it can also be a challenge uh, for your readers to not kind of be able to see who's in the right, who's in the wrong. Justice League Unlimited kind of touched on some of this a little bit yes, the Justice League are the heroes of the show, but in that first season, was the government the enemy of the show? 
Like, were they the villains of the show? Were the humans and normals, they're the antagonists to the Justice League, but were they totally wrong? There's a beautiful scene in there where Green Arrow, a non-powered hero, is up in the Watchtower with Supergirl and Superman, and he's trying to reason with them, saying, like, look, I get why these people are scared of you. I live here with you, and I'm sometimes still scared of you. This really helps characters dive in, whether, again, you're writing or at a table with a gaming table, dive into themselves and ask these questions about who they are and what they really believe in and see if it can uh, uh, bring up in not just the characters, but also the players to think about the things that really matter to them. For me, that's one of the great things about role-playing games in general, is putting my putting myself into a position I would not normally be in in my regular day-to-day life, and coming from the perspective of someone who I may not be anything like in my day-to-day life, and be able to spend some time in their shoes and, and think about both sides. So think about that the next time you're running a game, or think about putting that in if you're doing a novel and you want to kind of see, really, really get to what your characters might be like by dropping them into a situation like this. All right. And with that, let's uh, move on to some fan service. I've uh, admired your stance on animal rights for years. In fan service, we take some time to highlight the amazing fan-related creations celebrating DC, Young Justice, and other creative works we think Young Justice fans will love. This week, I have an AMV. It's by a YouTube channel, person, individual, called Young Justice is Best. It is to the song Safe and Sound. This is a version that's sung by Sam Tsui, which is the cover of a Taylor Swift song that comes from the Hunger Games soundtrack. So mash Hunger Games and Young Justice together. That's a... The crossover everyone needed. You had so I didn't recognize this song. (laughs) I've seen Hunger Games and I loved the books way before the movies had come out. But this was a game. This was was a movie that was big when you were (laughs) you saw it in the theater, right? Did you see the movies before you before you read the books? No, I read the. But it was like concurrent. Like the movies were start came out like soon after I read the books. Gotcha. And this was on this is on a CD that I own that is in my closet of the nice. room I am recording in right now. <laughs> nice. That was the because it wasn't the like soundtrack soundtrack like it wasn't the score. It was the Hunger Games songs from District Twelve CD that they released. Oh, that gotcha. was they got a bunch of artists to write basically fan songs for the Hunger Games. Gotcha. And this was Taylor Swift and the Civil Wars did Safe and Sound that made us all cry for forever when we were in middle school and having lots of emotions so when i was watching this amv i was like wow this is really good this is cool i like this song you had a whole nother layer of emotions <laughs> going on when you were watching the amv i was right? like hey it's that it's a cover of that song that i remember <laughs> nice um yeah it's great though so we'll have a we'll have a link down that to the uh, in there to the show notes and you can check that out for yourself and if you have recommendations for any fan service that you come across please Link us at our Twitter account or social media or send us an email at our email address, whether it's fan art or AMVs, cosplay, photo shoots, uh, whatever it happens to be. Shoot us links so we can check them out and we can boost the signal on these amazing creators. Just make sure everything's family friendly as best you can. And family friendly is important. Thank you. (laughs) Uh, Let's crash the mode because I got stuff to talk about. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. So our earlier segments assume listeners have only seen up to this uh, episode in Season 3. In Crashing the Mode, we'll be discussing spoilers and foreshadowing for future episodes, as well as plot elements from the original DC storylines that may affect what we see later on. We may also drop theories and speculations about what's to come based on wild flights of fancy. These spoilers will be based on only the first 13 episodes, because that's all we've seen at the time of this recording. So if you're spoiler wary, this is your warning. Let's do this. So, McComb... There's so much, but what has, from the first time I watched this episode, what's been putting me on edge for forever is McComb saying, I'm just here doing some favors and then I'll get help for the White Martian Revolution. I'm like, for who? Who are you helping here? What is happening? I'm nervous. Yeah. It's got to be Dark Side. It's Dark Side. Probably. But yeah. like, I don't know. Well, and, and that leads into one of it's mine. so vague. Which is Mantis. So Mantis self-identifies Mantis as part of Forager's Hive, and Mantis becomes a supervillain later working for Darkseid because he hates the new gods. 
So whatever Macomb is doing, if he is psychologically like changing the memories and emotional states of this this bug hive, he may have he may be inadvertently or purposefully turning Mantis into a supervillain under the power of Darkseid that he becomes later on in the comics. Ah, ah, it's bonkers. It's so much. Um, it is other, so much. The other thing, the other thing I have with Macomb is that this time through rewatching it again, one of the lines that stood out to me that is just so painful is him saying, your love makes you weak and easy to hurt when he's talking to McGann and viewing it again <laughs> for the millionth time. I'm like 80% convinced that this is co- going to come back to bite McGann by the end of the season because McCann, because McComb clearly knows about her earth life and he's going to go after somebody. Yeah. It's going to happen. And I don't know who it's going to be. And I'm worried because he's also he's met some he's we we don't know if he's met some of these people I'm I'm extrapolating but like she's been to Mars and she was with she was on Mars with Connor and Garfield so oh, like there is yeah. a chance Macom has met or seen either of them and I think and now thinking about it too hard for crashing the mode purposes there's no reason to show Macom everyone who matters in her life except you know. If bad things happen, because that's what she does. Her scrapbook, mental image, love is greater than anger thing just gives him a nice little lineup of everyone who matters in her life. (laughs) Oh, like a bullet point list. Thanks. We'll check these people off one at a time. Oh, yeah, (laughs) yeah. But like, you know, the the optimistic the optimistic approach is that like he'll go after Superboy who's indestructible and it'll be fine. But, you know. Anything could happen. <laughs> yeah. And I'll just I'm thinking, be anxious so, about this forever. Yeah. So I am, I'm looking, so you're looking at this as this like character driven deep dive on characters that we are really, really close to. And all I can think of is that Malafaak was responsible for the genocide of Mars. <laughs> and I'm like, what is going to happen What if the help he's getting from Darkseid, what if he says, oh, I'll get help with the problems on Mars from Darkseid is like, oh, yeah, I'll help you. We're going to nuke the site from orbit. Now they won't pick on you anymore. (laughs) I don't know. That doesn't seem like Darkseid because, but still, there's something that Malafa'ak, Malafa'ak does to trigger the genocide of the Martians in the comics. Yeah. And the red Martians in the comics are actually aren't. Martians now, there's like this little bit of stuff I've been able to find out. If anybody else knows more about this, please let us know. But there's this little bit of stuff of research I've been able to find out that I guess they used to be on in the DC Comics universe. They used to be on Mars, but now they live on Saturn, some moon of Saturn. And there's not that many of them, something like that. And then, but they used to come from Mars. And they, so I don't know where they're getting all that from or why they would bring red martians in unless they have a purpose or a reason for doing it like something terrible is going to happen so it's <laughs> terrible looking at like these characters that we know and love in this way he can personally hurt mcgann but also like he may start a chain reaction of stuff that's it, it's been it's been so curious to me why the martians are still alive in young <laughs> justice because in the comic I've been I wondering mean, for seven years i have been i have said it on the show over and over again like what is up with this this is so interesting to me because like the classic origin of John Jones is that he was pulled from Mars, right? And he was the last of his race, and that's what they did in Young Ju- in uh, Justice League Unlimited too. So uh, the introduction of her brother was just lighting a fuse, and we're waiting for the explosion. No, we gotta. Bonkers. We just gotta reform Macom, make him a good guy, so we can go to the Super Martian wedding. Everything will be fine. Show that boy some love. Show that boy some compassion. You know, all I can think of, every time you say the wedding, I think of Jeff Stormer telling the story about how Big Barda and uh, Mr. Miracle, right, were getting married back in the 60s or whatever. And Darkseid shows up at their wedding and says, well, I may be evil, but I can't stop a wedding. (laughs) I'm going back to Dark. I'm going back to Apocalypse. See ya. And then just leaves. And they live happily ever after. And I'm like, I can't get that scene with just superimposing McGann and Connor on this scene. It's too funny. It's uh, fine. This is fine. Oh, and because, no, because we got to continue the tradition. By the way, Halo is a mother box. Oh, right. Yes. And Halo is a mother box. <laughs> That's why Sphere glows when she heals herself. Yes. 
That's the tie in this time. <laughs> Is it? Okay, great. That's Perfect. what we'll say. <laughs> Glad we got that in. Halo's mother box. And with that, <laughs> I think we can say to out of the watch hour. Thank you all for spending some time with us. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, of course, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the yjfiles.tumblr.com, on our website, crashingthemode.com. And if that isn't enough, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcaster of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. And if you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you live outside of the U.S. We have a little harder time finding those, so just maybe make it easy on us. And if you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even a dollar a month can help us do in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and more. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours, under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.